As I'd mentioned, I'm going to transition and we're going to start a few talks that are more life sciences oriented. So our first speaker is going to be from Corteva. And that speaker is Dr. Yannick Jumba Hunan. And he's joined us today from Corteva, which I thought I would begin by telling you a little bit more about Corteva if you're not familiar with the company. It's a fairly new name, but it's a significant one. Many of you are probably familiar with their products if you're in, if you've touched agriculture in some way. This company was originated in 2018 when Dow DuPont spun off their agriculture business and went public in 2019 as Corteva. It is now the biggest pure play agriculture company in the world. Some of their brands include Pioneer, Mycogen, and DuPont. And in the research park, we're proud to have two sites of Corteva, one that tends to be more focused on bioinformatics and another that's focused on their product Granular, which was an acquisition by Corteva. So as we talk today in this session, as I said, this is gonna be a bit of a transition. And Dr. Funan is an expert in chem informatics. Now this company Corteva has worked both in agriculture and agriculture based chemicals. So I hope he'll tell you more about that. He joins us today and he has a background that is both a PhD in microbiology and biotechnology. And he's worked for Corteva out of Indianapolis. His responsibilities include machine learning, lead generation and organizational projects, including the area of chem informatics in scientific computing. So thank you for joining us. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Yannick. So thank you, Laura, for uh, the introduction. Uh, can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Okay, so thank you for the introduction, Laura. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, in my presentation, I will give a brief overview of artificial intelligence in life science and agriculture. And in particular, I will provide examples of how uh, AI can be used to facilitate the development of new molecules such as pharmaceuticals and drug protection agents. <clears throat> the typical drug development process can be divided into three main phases. The discovery phase, which involves the identification of biological target and the screening of chemicals for a desirable effect. An example of a desirable effect will be the inhibition of a polymerase enzyme in the COVID-19 virus. The successful chemicals will then be as selected as leads for the next phase. The development phase involves the optimization um, of leads with respect to um, uh, with respect to absorption, metabolism, toxicity, um, and um, other endpoints as well as the first two um, clinical uh, trials, uh, which involve a smaller doses and a small set of volunteers. The third phase is the commercialization phase, and it includes the phase three trials for a more uh, in-depth toxicological study, as well as an evaluation of our competitive products. And it is followed by the submission of, regular, uh, the, submission of uh, the product to regulatory bodies and the launch. Um, several challenges, um, as you can see here, um, uh, are uh, impeding the process of drug discovery and pesticide discovery. First of all, it's a very lengthy process, as you can see, with an overall uh, failure rate of 96%. The, pr the process for the discovery of crop protection agent is similar to uh, the drug development process. Among the challenges, um, we can say that it takes a, a overall 12 years to bring a new drug or pesticide to the market yeah. and reported costs can be as high as $2.6 billion. There is a steady increase in population coupled with a decrease in agricultural land. This will um, potentially lead to more exposure of living species such as humans, animals, and plants to stimuli, higher pollution and more food insecurity. Uh, also, the biological systems are very complex and adaptive. So individuals from a particular species might have differences in how they perform a specific process. And another complication is that due to the complexity of those biological um, systems, the prediction of many biological processes uh, solely on the theoretical basis of first principle is not yet possible. Therefore, scientists are 
uh, forced to rely mostly on data-driven models. However, experimental data is often only available at low scale. And when available, uh, large scale or big data requires very powerful tools to be leveraged. So what is AI? AI or artificial intelligence uh, can be defined as a theory and development of computer systems that are able to perform tasks normally uh, requiring human intelligence. So AI um, utilizes system and software that can pause, interpret, and learn from the input data to make independent decisions in order to accomplish specific tasks. Now, according to markets and markets, the market for AI in the whole world um, and specifically in the biopharma industry is expected to increase um, from about $198 million in 2018 to about 3.8 or 3.9 billion by 2025 um, with the most significant investments in drug discovery. Um, for instance, earlier this year, after only 12 months of research, a small company uh, in England submitted a new drug invented uh, <clears throat> predominantly by artificial intelligence for the treatment of uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. According to the Markets and Markets um, website, the global AI market in uh, agriculture is projected to grow from about $1 billion in 2020 to about $4 billion by 2026 with major investments in data generation, machine learning, and robotics. So what are the key factors for the increasing adoption of AI in life sciences? Uh, the data is being generated uh, at an unusually high rate. Uh, moreover, there are several efforts to make data available uh, in structured electronic formats. We can also uh, mention the computational resources for development, storage, and software deployment that are more accessible, more efficient, and cheaper, as well as the computing power that is increasingly um, exponent and exponentially, uh, sorry, that is exponentially increasing while the computing costs are decreasing dra dramatically. It's also very important to note that AI and data analytics uh, algorithms have gotten uh, to a stage of maturity where they can be easily <clears throat> applied to leverage very large amounts of data and to solve more complex tasks. Um, the main approaches of machine learning um, can be divided in supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And depending on the task that you want to achieve, uh, one, uh, you might um, select, you know, uh, algorithms that are um, applicable to either of those branches. AI um, is the next wave of innovation in life science, but it has been part of, uh, you know, I, uh, li the life science for, for several decades, actually. Um, <clears throat> the first wave of AI was marked by the introduction of semantic processing logical reasoning, as well as man-machine interaction. So the first models at the time, if you get back, go back into literature, were mostly expert systems, as you will uh, uh, recognize. In, uh, one also notes you know, the founding of modern uh, QSAR practices um, in the early 60s. I will go a little bit deeper uh, into that specific aspect. In the much longer second wave of AI, uh, one notes the automation um, and machine learning that were first introduced in the pharma industry. Uh, several electronic chemical databases were published, including virtual libraries that were developed uh, using combinatorial chemistry. The third wave <clears throat> was marked by the first implementations of reinforcement learning and widespread um, adoption or development of active learning methods that were catalyzed by the, uh, uh, the adoption of specialized um, architectures such as GPUs. Uh, the design, make, test, and analyze process or cycle that I will describe uh, on this slide is central to the process of constructing and testing hypothesis in drug discovery. Most steps of these cycles are still done manually, involving many chemical science, many, many scientists. Um, and the idea is to use AI to uh, replicate those efforts so that uh, scientists can use 
you know, the uh, time for more innovative um, tasks. So molecular design can combine um, optimization parameters such as predictive models, molecular similarity, uh, with, molecule, with molecule generation and search, as well as cognitive search to simulate the design make test cycles. And because of the complexity and adaptability of polybiological systems, as mentioned earlier, data-driven models that are used in these cycles um, can be improved only through several iterations. So I'm going to describe uh, the different phases of this cycle a bit more in depth. So the design part consists of virtual, uh, virtually creating molecule based, on, for instance, on a, on a priori knowledge. We start, for example, with a molecule or a class thereof and generate or collect many similar or derivative molecules through library, uh, library enumeration, data mining, or search. Moreover, generative models um, that are now uh, one of the, the main topics um, in, in deep learning can allow to design new molecules from scratch with specific properties. For example, a given biological activity uh, within a specific uh, solubility range. For the make part uh, of the D, uh, DMTA cycle, uh, retrosynthesis, reaction condition, and reactivity predictions have been the focus. Over the last decade, the significant advances on, on AI uh, and deep learning in particular spark a renewed interest in this, in this area. Automation of experiments uh, can now enable autonomous data generation that will be used in other phases. The testing phase involves uh, assays to test the compound activities on enzymes, receptors, ion channels, and so on and so forth. And the testing methods will differ and are specific to target. Now, during the analysis phase, the active molecules from the previous phase are subjected to a more rigorous analysis and screening uh, by assessing other desirable uh, properties using, for example, QSR, uh, metabolism prediction, uh, and so on and so forth. The results are then fed back into the system to improve um, the model prediction quality and to rapidly increase the applicability domain of the models. Now I'm going to um, discuss three applications um, of AI in molecular design. And the first two uh, involve computer aided synthesis planning and metabolism prediction. So computer aided synthesis planning uh, consists of predicting how and whether a molecule, a target molecule that you, let's say, has identified as a potential uh, drug can be synthesized from available molecules. So it was introduced by Corey and Whipke in the 60s. And as I mentioned earlier, those systems were rather um, based on expert knowledge. Uh, the main approaches include rule-based uh, systems and machine learning uh, um, systems. And they are applicable in the process of um, in, in process and synthetic chemistry for yield optimization, chemical safety, and also to ensure that the product can be generated in large masses, but while um, not compromising the environment. So the green chemistry is a very significant um, <clears throat> um, characteristic here. The prediction of metabolism degradation is also a very important um, process because metabolism plays a very impactful role in how a molecule will behave in the body or in the environment. So given a molecule, these tools aim at predicting how um, it is transformed by enzymes into metabolites. So those are um, biological processes in contrast to uh, the synthetic processes that are more uh, artificially made. So, these uh, tasks were introduced, the first, the first systems were introduced by Wipke also in the, in the 80s. And uh, as mentioned, they were rule-based. So the main approaches can be you know, rule-based or machine learning based. And they are applicable in lead generation, lead optimization, regulatory sciences, and also environmental science. So before we proceed, I would like to uh, discuss briefly how data can be collected, processed, and consumed. 
experimental reaction data, uh, whether it's synthetic reaction or biological reactions, um, are published in scientific journals, patents, or captured by proprietary corporate electronic uh, lab laboratory net notebooks, also called ELN. The reaction data will then go to various data extraction, curation, transformation, aggregation, and integration processes before they can be searched or downloaded. The reaction data mining can be used to address in-depth questions from scientists, uh, for example, building models or, um, don't, um, or some other specific questions. The corporate ELN or electronic laboratory, uh, laboratory notebook data captured um, can be extracted, cleaned, and also annotated before being loaded for high performance search data mining. And uh, the last phase consists of exploitation for any different uh, given um, tasks. A similar workflow is uh, also applicable to the extraction of uh, and processing, as well as the loading of, of other types of chemicals, for example, physical chemical properties that were measured in the laboratory. The general workflow for supervised machine learning models um, and the application of those models to work chemical challenges consists of three main phases. The featureization, the training and validation, and uh, the application of the model to the prediction. The general workflow for validation uh, of machine learning uh, starts with splitting the data into test set and training sets. And um, for each train and test set pairs, the data is uh, trained and evaluated. And um, this helps in you know, the confirmation or information of the validity of a model. The train and test splits can be based um, you know, um, on random selections, time split, or chemical scaffold. It is worth noting that having a better data set is usually more important than the functional form of the model. Now, <clears throat> for um, the computation, or the computer aided synthesis planning, there are three main tasks uh, that are relevant. Um, the first task is the retrosynthesis prediction. So you start from the target molecule, which is a molecule that you uh, um, potentially see as being uh, the next drug or the next blockbuster, and you identify possible synthetic disconnection uh, and precursor molecules. You repeat the process until you get to a set of precursors that are available. This requires modules for single step retrosynthesis search algorithm to search the tree and the list of available precursor. Obviously, you have to start from somewhere to make the final molecule A here. Additionally, given the set of reactants, you go in a forward, um, um, in a forward direction instead of a backward direction once you have established the pathways here so to figure out what the best conditions are for the reactions, because you want to have an optimal yield. And you also predict the forward reaction to identify the major products. So although you will realize at this point, for example, that this intermediate can be produced by an available compound and another compound that is not available, you want to make sure that by mixing those two compounds, you will get the intermediate H as a major product and not as a minor product. So that will help you make sure that you always get an optimal yield and that you finally get an optimal uh, product at the end. There are several examples of tools. Uh, some of them are based on machine learning, for example, ASCOS and AISI Fender, which are all open source, but are also rule-based systems. And there are you know, pros and cons for the, those different types of uh, models. An example of rule-based uh, system is Cynthia, which is used um, um, a lot in, in um, several corporations that deal with uh, molecular design. Here is an example of the Sincha interface. The molecule here called uh, Rane Brutinib, uh, a drug, is shown in the middle with the different uh, reactions that lead to it. So in this case, for example, uh, 
the molecule in green is available while the molecule in uh, uh, purple is not available. So you can go down the tree and figure out a path that will lead to precursors that are available. So basically, um, you could start from these two molecules that are available and then, you know, two, one, two, three steps, uh, four steps generate the target molecule. Now, whether you select this path or this path uh, would depend also on what your priority is. Are you looking for more green chemistry? Do you want uh, something that is going to be cheaper? Do you want a, a process that is going to take less time? It's up to the chemist uh, to decide. But at the end of the day, uh, you have such tools that are now available to guide the synthesis planning. So here's an example of the, this is the, the, the main molecule. And here's an example of a precursor molecule that leads to this molecule. Now, the next <clears throat> topic is uh, metabolism prediction. So metabolism determines the fate of a molecule in living species and consequently influences its safety profile and biological effect. So um, several approaches exist for the prediction of um, metabolism of small molecules, especially. The prediction can be enzyme-centered or it can be, uh, you know, uh, centered around reaction template. And uh, in the case of enzyme-centered uh, metabolism prediction, uh, given a molecule, one can predict the substrate selectivity or the site of metabolism. So the site of metabolism are atoms or regions in the molecule where a reaction occurs. So these are usually um, done via machine learning. So once this, the site is, uh, or the sites are, you know, selected or predicted, or once the substrate, uh, substrate selectivity is uh, predicted, so whether the substrate is actually interacting with the enzymes, then one can apply those um, reaction templates and generate structures. In the case of reaction-centered prediction, one can apply machine learning models to predict whether a template is applicable to a, chem a chemistry. So the rules are applied and one generates those different metabol metabolites. So this requires a module to predict and rank the site of metabolism or the enzyme uh, substrate selectivity or the reaction groups or reaction patterns, right? So it also requires a library of reaction templates to apply or select via prediction. Uh, but also you need modules that are either specific, like some modules will focus on one specific uh, instance of this, of a class of enzymes, or it can uh, you know, be applied to a wider uh, range of enzymes. So an example uh, of tool using uh, machine learning is Meteor. Metatrans is a relatively recent tool that uses actually deep learning to predict uh, what reaction templates are applicable to a certain molecule and then apply the template directly to the molecule. Rule-based um, tools for metabolism prediction includes Metabol Expert and Biotransformer is an hybrid um, of the two. So it uses machine learning as well as rule-based. This is an example of the output of predictions for this molecule that I showed earlier. Um, and um, it gives you the different transformation, the different metabolites, and also uh, different uh, physical chemical properties for the predicted metabolites, as well as the type of uh, reactions that can be further used, you know, uh, later um, for deeper analysis. Now, probably one of the most important and interesting applications of AI in the space of biomolecular design is cues off for prediction of activity. So um, since the cost of obtaining and screening new heats, um, you know, in experiment, uh, using experimental platforms is rather high, cues are models are among the most significant tools for uh, medicinal chemists. So how does it work? Initially, the data sets uh, are collected from external sources, curated and integrated um, to remove or correct, you know, uh, inconsistent data. Then using this data, QSR models are developed 
and validated following best practice and modeling. The QSR models are then used to identify compounds from you know, large libraries of chemicals uh, that are predicted to be active against selected endpoints. Um, and um, these chemical libraries can be sometimes, you know, up to 2 million, uh, 10 million, 100 million of compounds large. So this will be a very, very significantly large uh, number um, of molecules to be uh, processed experimentally. So this speeds up the QSR modeling uh, approach here, and QSR based ritual screening will uh, very speed up um, the lead identification and optimization process very, very uh, significantly. So in summary, uh, we can see that AI more than ever impacts the DMTA cycle uh, of molecular design by uh, enabling big data ingestion, exploitation, learning, uh, optimization, and also rapid decision making. So there is a lot of room to improve. So every single week or every single month, there is a new paper about a new type of architecture uh, or models to predict um, um, a specific outcome. Um, but there are still a lot of challenges. So uh, we still need a lot of data. So for the different endpoints, there's all, all, all already uh, there's there's still uh, you know a lack of data because molecules are very they can be very small, but they have uh, a lot of functional groups, and uh, you need very diversified data to be able to build a model that is generalizable enough. AI and digital transformation require a cultural change. It's not every company that is willing to change the way it operates to to uh, digitalize this information, but uh, it's a long process. Uh, the market um, of AI is desperate for talented AI experts. So hopefully you'll be the next uh, ones to embark on this amazing journey. So thank you again for listening and uh, I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. Yannick, thanks for all that detail and analysis of how AI is impacting Corteva and life sciences. One of the new initiatives that is happening on campus at the University of Illinois is a new molecular maker lab, and it's at a new AI institute on campus focused on life sciences. I don't know if you've uh, had familiarity with that or worked in- No, not yet. That's a, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Molecular ma maker lab. Okay. Um, is, it, is it associated with a specific um, you know, professor that you know of or- uh, I, uh, I think Marty, this is based on some of the work of Marty Burke and having molecules made on demand. And he had been the founder of a company, Revolution Medicine, that started in its very early days here at the research park in the incubator, but has since been um, growing strongly in San Francisco and IPO this last year. So um, on campus, there are a variety of researchers that are involved in biophysics and in chemical sciences working together. Maybe our next speaker, John Cole, Cole, will even know more about it as well. Right, right now we can't speak to that. So it's being discussed internally. Okay, thanks, Dirk. So Yannick, I also was looking at your background and I'll see if there are other questions that come up in the chat, um, but it's really fascinating. And I thought I would ask you a little bit more about yourself as well. So. And a man that has been around the world, um, just very fascinated by your career. You spent time at Max Planck in Germany. You spent time at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, France, and received your PhD from the University of Alberta. Can you tell us a little bit more about your career and journey as a data scientist and in this particular field of application in chemistry and biology? So I have started really applying data science uh, on a more regular basis when I was doing my PhD. Uh, and when I came to the company, uh, Corteva, I had more opportunities to do so. So I've been doing data science consistently for the past few years. So um, having traveled around and, and you know, um, and worked under uh, several very, very talented and engaging uh, uh, managers. I think um, it, it's, it's, it's amazing how science, um, is, science is viewed almost the same everywhere, right? So um, it, it's about finding, finding a niche that you really are engaged into. And data science um, 
is very, very, um, very, very useful right now. It's almost everywhere. So AI uh, as a bigger field, so the, the bigger field is, is um, you know, um, everywhere. So I never knew, I never expected back in, you know, 2005 that I would ever hear about, uh, you know, AI in, 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 in um, molecular design the way I hear about it now, or even in other, you know, uh, spaces such as, um, you know, law or medicine. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. So, um, and now with the recent, um, you know, um, advances in deep learning, reinforcement learning, uh, there is quite a lot um, that that needs to be done. There are a lot of opportunities and people are just trying every day, every week there is a new paper. And so it's a very exciting field, so. Well, thank you for sharing how you've been applying that. It was interesting to hear from Dr. Jerry Carter at John Deere earlier today, also talking about reinforcement learning, but using it for deep racer league and for agriculture equipment at John Deere. So a very different application, but same underlying data science principles as well. When you're talking to perhaps students that are involved in this session today, if they're interested in this type of career, what would you tell them to pursue? Is it a biology basis to begin with or chemistry and then data science or what sort of order and combination of skills are needed to get into this work? I think at the end of the day, it would be good if they already uh, at the beginning have an idea of what they actually would like to achieve. I think that's the, the most important question. Me, I started as um, uh, a computational biology. So from, from the first in my bachelor, I was doing computational biology. I evolved a little bit into computational chemistry. And I started doing chemioformatics only in my PhD. So uh, when I started with computational biology, I had no idea what chemioformatics was. So sometimes, you know, along the way, you, you, you know, you find, you find new territories that are really exciting and that allow you to actually do, you know, what you like to do. So uh, while I was doing computational biology, I moved a little bit into computational chemistry when I was doing my, my projects, uh, master projects and bachelor projects, because I was really excited by, you know, the interactions of small molecules and big molecules. So evidently, that's how I, you know, got steered into chemioformatics. And then data scientists, uh, data science, because chemioformatics um, uses a lot of data science for uh, different applications. So uh, you have to have an idea of what you want to achieve. Um, and uh, data sciences, like I said, is in every everywhere right now. So if you're looking for a good opportunity for work, you can apply it in every specific aspect, whether it's supply chain or law or medicine or you know biology. I mean, there, there is a lot, there, there are a lot of opportunities out there right now. Well, thank you, Yannick. And that's a good thing too, because I, I've met people who started applying data science and computational biology, but while working in insurance companies now doing the same thing. Well, I think Corteva would like uh, many of those data scientists to be working for their operations and they have internships posted right now. They're really interesting and detailed project oriented internships. And so for students interested in this type of field, check those out. Corteva internships on the Research Park job board with very specific project aims in automation, data scientists and bio bioinformatics. Um, I am going to close out and say that I mistakenly said Marty Burke, while famous uh, researcher on campus, it's actually Human Zhao, who is a professor at the Institute for Genomic Biology that's leading that molecular maker lab. 